the 50s, I guess you have uh, Timothy Leary tries psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico, I think, and then starts his psilocybin research project in, in Harvard, which moves on to LSD. And then the, the very famous episodes of, of what happened in, in the 60s. Um, do you, what's your kind of take on the, I guess, the cultural and political factors that, that got us to the situation we're now in, where you have these, these medicines being illegal? Hmm. Yeah, I, can I chop that up into two different questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I almost think that we're in a different situation again now from where we were after the sort of um, Timothy Learyism, if you will. So if I chop it up a little bit. So yeah, 1962, 1961, 62 is a really interesting moment. This is when the Harvard experiments that Leary was in, in charge of kind of become known publicly. And it really sort of catapults this research into a public conversation that prior to this, I think, relatively speaking, was taking place within scientific circles. Um, so I think there's a, a sort of psychedelic heyday, but it wasn't necessarily in the New York Times and it wasn't showing up in mainstream news. And, uh, you know, it was still very much sort of within academic circles, even if it wasn't all academics involved. By 1962, that changes, and I think Timothy Leary is in part um, a main player in that change, partly because his research, you know, sounds and is so scandalous and so risque and salacious that, you know, it makes the front page headlines. But also, he's very charismatic, and he defends this research, and he defends this approach, but also sort of like throws caution to the wind and says, you know, throws Harvard under the bus in a way. Um, and so he becomes this kind of embodiment of a character that psychedelic enthusiasts want to believe in. He becomes a champion. He's a leader. He's a guru. He's very provocative um, and very charismatic. And I think he becomes a bit of a leader of something that had been kind of bubbling beneath the surface. At the same time, it also throws a wrench into the conversations amongst scientists as to how now to react to this publicity that they weren't really dealing with before. So you didn't have the Kennedys calling you and asking, you know, what's happening in mental health research with psychedelics? They were very interested in mental health research, but now psychedelics are on the radar and everyone's worried about the ethics of that. In Canada and in Britain and throughout most of Western Europe, Thalidomide was also, I think, an important component of this. The United States never authorized the direct sale of thalidomide, so it's, it's less of a matter in the United States, but, but as thalidomide comes forward, as it, it is you know, hailed initially as one of those sort of pharmaceuticals that's being sold to the public as a safe drug, um, and as children are born with teratogenic growth defects, it also creates a real sort of public health campaign and an image of science gone wrong or science that hasn't been tested properly or safely enough to bring out to consumers. And I think that the, the, the campaigns around that and the publicity around thalidomide really sort of shake public confidence in the scientific community to make appropriate recommendations for what is safe. And as psychedelics and lyrism and others, but he certainly embodies a certain character of that, those sort of come together at the same time, like literally in the same year, those kind of headlines are clashing or, or you know, taking up space on major newspapers. And I think it changes the conversation quite dramatically, both about how do we trust science? Rachel Carson's Silent Spring comes out at the same time as well. You know, she's talking about environmental toxicity. And so there's a cynicism growing here about how much faith to put in our scientists to keep us healthy and safe. And I think psychedelics in some parts get caught up in that. Part of it, I will say personally, I think is due to Leary and his absolutely enormous ego and capacity to get in front of television cameras. Um, you know, had he been an introvert, he may not have fulfilled the role that he did, but I think this would have happened without Leary because I think there were a variety of other um, contextual features that were shaking our sort of public confidence in in the public health authorities and in scientific figures. Okay, so fast forward to today. I think that the psychedelic renaissance, as Ben Sessa has called it, and many, many people have picked that up now, I think is aptly named. It is interesting to see this kind of resurrecting of some of these ideas, 
But I think it's also fascinating to think about, and I'd be curious your thoughts on this. I think just like in the 1950s, as there was a kind of social or cultural cynicism about the state of mental health therapies, the paradigm that we were living in per, per se, you know, psychoanalytic therapies or bodily therapies, lobotomies and whatnot, they were, people were questioning their utility. And we sort of rolled into this psychopharmaceutical paradigm. And I think in 2020, not just because it's good for hindsight, in you know the year 2020, we look back and think, well, are opiates really the best way of dealing with pain? You know, are we creating addictions by um, subscribing to a model of not just mental health and mental illness uh, treatments, but of dealing with trauma, of dealing with all sorts of kind of human discomfort using a, a psychopharmaceutical frame? And I think there is a, a sort of general exhaustion with that model and a, a questioning of it that allows for thinking about alternatives yet again. And we see this cycle through the history of psychiatry, the history of neuroscience. And I think there's another moment here of questioning and agitation for searching, searching for alternatives that both has us looking backwards. You know, what did we miss in those indigenous models? What have we missed from the past? But also looking forward, like, what are we doing with palliative care? which is a conversation that is taking on a veracity that we haven't seen really to this degree in the past. And yeah. I, I think there's a different moment here unfolding that I'm quite excited to witness. <laughs> yeah, I think you're definitely right as well that it's, um, it's high time for, for those kinds of questions that you were saying, those kinds of reckonings with the way we currently think about mental health care. And I mean, through my education, the thing that I guess stood out to me most strongly was the way that the, the narratives we get the, narrative, the kind of cultural narratives around things like addiction, depression, uh, the are uh, very neat narratives that fit into the prevailing economic system. And instead of looking at, you know, when all of, especially something like addiction and depression, clearly is, um, it has, it's influenced by a variety of factors in, in your life, right, in your, your health, you know, how you're living your life. But a culture that doesn't want to to look at those uh, issues, you know, say, take something like addiction in um, indigenous communities in in North America, you know, the, it's easier to say, well, perhaps there's a genetic thing rather than, well, perhaps there's been incredible uh, trauma inflicted on these people, and perhaps there should be some kind of reparation. That's a far more <laughs> the economic system doesn't, you know, I think that's a, a yeah a, a far less comfortable thing to think about. And so, do you think that psychedelics could ha have the potential in this renaissance to maybe help us envision new models of healthcare? I, you know, I, I try to avoid questions like this because I, I plead historian. I'm like, I only look backwards. Um, but I mean, it's a flippant response, but I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm rather hopeful. I'm rather optimistic that I, I don't think that psychedelics are a magic bullet. I don't really believe in magic bullets to be quite honest. I don't think it's, you know, going to necessarily like transform the way we think but i do think that opening up the possibility uh, and, and allowing for research and study and thoughtful you know interrogation not just within laboratories perhaps but thinking about these things also allows us to imagine diversity in different ways both in terms of diversity of healthcare options but also diversity of experiences and how to prioritize those kinds of uh, the knowledge, the experience that comes with it, thinking about, you know, thinking about trauma in different ways, for example, which is a really big area of research, I think. I do think that there's a reckoning that will open beyond, you know, the focus on the molecules themselves, um, but to thinking about, you know, that larger context. I'm not sure we'll see like a countercultural revolution, um, you know, much like we, we might sort of um, caricature of the 1960s, but I think there's, I think there are, are really exciting possibilities and I maybe end with palliative care. I, I think this is a really interesting area. Um, Canada just had its first psilocybin, legal psilocybin um, trial with a palliative patient here a couple of weeks ago. It happened in Saskatoon, which I find is really interesting that we've kind of come full circle with Saskatchewan being, you know, strangely the place of the word psychedelic. And then here it is again um, in a new iteration of this moment. I think palliative care is interesting in part because the word itself was coined in 1987. 
we didn't have palliative units, although people have been dying forever. <laughs> but thinking about dying care, theorizing dying care, and focusing on it as you know part of something that we might demand even as modern humans um, has brought a different kind of political energy into that space. And it's interesting to think that it's also a different group of people who are going through those palliative care units. So it's not niche. You know, this isn't this isn't just for you know, I don't know, expensive patients who have particular kinds of disorder X. Um, but this is a different kind of space for different conversations and a different kind of humanity and dignity that's afforded to dying care. I think psychedelics in that space is a really interesting place to have this conversation anew because it allows for different players to participate in that conversation who might be a little bit hesitant to endorse the use of psychedelics in a way that they see associated with replacing addiction or harm reduction or something. I don't agree with those narratives, but I think there is a kind of resistance to endorsing psychedelics like cannabis. But I think if we imagine it in a different space, we can start talking about spirituality. Spirituality is already present in the palliative care unit. And there's different ways in which that might challenge us as, you know, today's civilization, if you will, but like even challenge specific professional organizations who work and interact in that space to imagine psychedelics in a different way. And those are not necessarily the same people who would have endorsed it otherwise. I think that's really important to find those kinds of alliances now. If we, if we imagine a world where psychedelics are decriminalized, I think it's not going to come from, with all due respect, a handful of champions but it's going to require some kind of broad-based endorsement of a different model that challenges our current system. Right, yeah, and I think it also, yeah, you're mentioning kind of broadening from just focusing on the molecule, and you also mentioned kind of different ways of knowing in the past. I think, and also to bring this full circle, the bringing it back to the, the indigenous use of these things and, and integrating the ways these have always been used, right, instead of presuming that the, the kind of white-coated scientists can just do it all by themselves with, without integrating that. I think that has a real potential for changing the way that we think about how we, you know, how we look after each other. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, COVID has presented us with a whole variety of challenges, but there's also, um, you know, I, I think we see the ways in which health is political and our healthcare is intensely political and it's not not just you know waiting for a bed in a particular clinic but we're all affected by this in some way or another and uh, i think it's a moment that we, we may be able to seize upon as um, as we sort of imagine the way that people are are more alive to the ideas about the ways in which health and access to healthcare are deeply political right and i'm sure covid is also uh, providing the uh the, the med medical historians of the future with a, a huge amount of material in, in this kind of digital age, you know, I mean, it's got to be a strange silver lining maybe for people in, in, in your profession. It, it's true. Um, we've joked, uh, my colleagues and I have joked, you know, wow, who knew that historians had some kind of public significance? 